Hello and welcome to the third lesson in space physics. We're going to be looking at orbits in this lesson. Just a reminder that all the space physics is physics only. My name is Mr Pratt and I'm Director of Science for Outward Grange Academy's Trust. Let's get on with it. So for the lesson you're going to need a pen, paper or an exercise book. There's some quite important notes that you need to make, probably one side of A4. Unless you're needing to watch this video on your mobile phone, get it out of the way, get it on silent and avoid all the distractions that you can. Right, starter then, that's recall. It's recall going back to the forces topic, which may have been nine, 12 months ago. So I want you to tell me what the difference between speed and velocity is, what the difference between distance and displacement is, and what equation expresses Newton's second law. I'll give you two minutes. If you're struggling, answer to question one and question two are very similar. Half your time's gone. You will need all of this prior knowledge during this lesson. So if you're at this point and you think I haven't got a clue, it might be an idea just to flick back in the revision book and go and look at the, the second half of the forces topic where you've got vectors, scalars and Newton's laws. Question one then, difference between speed and velocity. Speed is a scalar, velocity is a vector. And what that means is if we're talking about the speed of something, we only need to talk about its magnitude. So that's the amount. So we might say something has got a speed of 22 metres per second. And that's it. We've said the magnitude, the number. When, though, we're talking about velocity, it's a vector. So it's not just the number that we need. We need to know the direction. And we'd either represent that with a plus or a minus to show that it's going left or right on the page. If it was an exam question. Or we would represent it with an arrow, a vector arrow, showing the director that the velocity is in. Very similar to question two. In this case, distance is the scalar. So we talk about a distance in metres, but we're not overly bothered about the direction that something may have moved in. But displacement is a vector, so it has magnitude and direction. So we'd represent the displacement with an arrow, or we talk about if an object moves four meters to the right we'll say that's a positive displacement and then if it moves back again and it moves four meters to the left it had a negative displacement and you'd end up with the displacement overall it'd be zero because it's not moved question three newton's second law that's force equals mass times acceleration really important equation in the forces topic but because we're going to be looking at forces of gravity on objects with a mass 
and talking about an acceleration when we're explaining circular motion of an object in an orbit. First outcome then, we need to simply describe how an object gets into orbit by going around another object and to describe how the speed affects the radius of an orbit. So we're going to talk about different orbits and look at why they happen, why they happen at different distances, why they might be different going around different objects. Here then we've got a little animation of Mars. We've got Mars's two natural satellites on there and we've got some uh, artificial satellites that we have put there, humans have put there. So I want you to ask, answer question one, two and three. Two minutes. Halfway through your time. Question one then, what is something doing if it's orbiting? Well, it's simply going around another object in a set path. Could be a circular path, but it doesn't have to be. It can be an elliptical path. Question two, what force makes an object in space orbit? We're always going to be talking about gravity. Gravity is the force that we're going to be talking about. Number three. Here you see two different types of satellite. What's the difference? Well, I might have given that, given that away uh, at the beginning when I said that they were natural and artificial. Let's just say that I was testing to see if you were listening. There are other differences here. We've got all of them there, Deimos, Phobos, and one of the artificial satellites are going around in circular orbits. The Mars Express there is doing an elliptical orbit where it's not always at the same distance from the planet. Let's have a closer look at the International Space Station then. This is an object that you can see in the night sky. If you go on the internet, you can have a look at when it's passing overhead. It's quite easy to spot because it's travelling particularly fast. It'll cross the full horizon of your night sky above you in a couple of minutes. It's moving very, very quickly. Fact file then. Orbital height, 408 kilometres, which is quite a low orbit. It's not particularly high up. Seems like a long way, but you can see from that picture that it's a relatively low orbit. Because it's a low orbit, it gets around the Earth very quickly, just under 93 minutes to do a full 
circumference of the Earth. So its speed in that orbit is 7,660 metres per second, so it's motoring. And it's got a mass of 419,700 kilograms, so that's just under 420 metric tonnes. The International Space Station orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, travelling about 17,500 miles per hour. It's an understatement to say the astronauts and cosmonauts on board enjoy a spectacular view. But daily life in lower Earth's orbit is hard work, and at times, complicated. Even getting clean is a challenge. No shower here. Instead, they use towels, wipes, and a rinseless shampoo. And I take my no-rinse shampoo and rub it in. Again, kind of working it out to the end. On board this $100 billion research laboratory, there are never more than six crew members at a time. They stay for about six months, which can feel like an eternity living on prepackaged food. We use a lot of the same items the military uses, the meals ready to eat, the MREs. Every so often, supply ships, like the one that exploded this week, bring fresh fruit and vegetables. Here at our dinner table, this is a table for six. We don't have plates. Of course, we don't need plates in, uh, in space because, again, everything would just float away. There are no refrigerators in space, and salt and pepper? only in liquid form. Otherwise, the particles would be airborne, clogging air vents or getting in an astronaut's eye. Peanut butter on a specially packaged tortilla is a space station staple. A weightless tortilla. Okay, we got one tortilla. Whoa, got away. Most of the day is spent working on science experiments that only a microgravity environment can provide. There are also medical experiments, which can judge how well their bodies adjust to life in space for long periods of time. Of course, sometimes there are spacewalks. Otherwise, it's more mundane stuff, like what you might do at home back on Earth. If you got to change out some filters or you got to, you know, light bulbs burned out, you got to go take time to go change the light bulbs out. And while you may be weightless in space, exercise is a must. Using equipment you won't find on Earth, like this treadmill. We attach by these rings the harness to a system of hooks and bungee cords. If you're wondering about a bathroom break during the day, thanks to microgravity, using this tiny toilet isn't easy. And of course, you do have your privacy. There's a little door. Sleeping is easier, as long as the astronauts remember to tie down their sleeping bags. When the mission is complete, a Soyuz spacecraft brings them back to Earth. The return trip takes just three and a half hours. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. Mm. Okay, there's an error that causes a misconception in that video. It talked about the astronauts being weightless on the International Space Station. That's not true. On the International Space Station, it's 408 kilometers above the Earth's surface, so gravity is less than it is on the surface of the Earth, but only 10% only less. So 90% of 2.8 newtons for every kilogram is 8.8. .8. So it's not really enough that you would actually notice you were lighter. So that's not the reason why you see things floating about on the International Space Station. So the ISS and all its contents are actually in free fall. So they're just falling, accelerating down towards the ground. So it feels the same inside the International Space Station as it would in a lift that was broken and suddenly started hurtling down. So falling a broken, in a broken lift would feel the same. The only difference being on a satellite on the International Space Station, it never actually hits the Earth. So free falling 
feels odd, but it only becomes dangerous when you suddenly decelerate hitting the ground. So then you get a huge and damaging force and you can model the amount of that force using Newton's second law again, F equals ma. So the force on you when they hit the ground is gonna be your mass times your acceleration or deceleration in this case. And because that deceleration is huge because you're suddenly hitting the ground, you would have a huge force on you and you'd be killed. On the last clip that you saw, she survived because the cable had coiled up, so it acted like a spring. So it made that deceleration a smaller number, which then meant that the force on it would also be a smaller number. But the difference then between all orbiting objects is that they don't reach the ground and they don't reach the ground because they're moving sideways at the same time as they're falling. This thought experiment was um, first hypothesized by Isaac Newton. So we've got someone who's obviously very tall there, stood on top of a mountain and they've got uh, a rock and they can throw the rock. There you go. And it falls in a parabolic, if you're into your maths, orbit, a parabolic trajectory and it hits the ground sometime later. So it falls in an arc. You throw it a bit harder, the same type of path that it follows but it goes that little bit further and further again but if you can throw it fast enough it will fall to work towards the earth at the same curve as the curve of the earth itself so you can effectively get it going all the way around in an orbit and that's what an orbit is. It's when it's moving so fast that as it falls towards the object that it's orbiting around, it never actually gets any closer. Now, this wouldn't work on the Earth because you'd get slowing down caused by the drag, the air resistance as you're throwing it. But in theory, that would work. So if you throw it harder, then it would curve less than the curvature of the Earth. So it would go out and you would escape. So that's how a rocket's launched. You need to get it going fast enough that it can accelerate away from the Earth, escape gravity by going at a bigger curve than the curvature of the Earth. So we've got three paths marked there, one where we just get a normal thrown object, one where we've got the object going into orbit, and the second one where it's going fast enough that it can escape the pull of the Earth, which we'd need for a rocket. Let's start off modelling satellites then. Let's set it going, mark on its orbital path. You can see the time ticking here. So we've got an orbital time of similar to the International Space Station. It's not to scale, otherwise if it was to scale, we'd find it quite difficult to see the International Space Station. So it's hurtling round. So we can see its orbital path circular. Mark on the gravity. So we can see the gravitational force pulling on the satellite always towards the centre of the Earth. We've got an equal and opposite force on the Earth there, Newton's third law. The reason that the satellite's not falling and hitting the planet is because it's got this velocity sideways and it needs a high velocity sideways because we've got quite a small orbit. So it's trying to fall towards the surface of the Earth, but because of the curvature of the Earth, it never gets any closer. What we can do here is just see the effect of putting up a a different mass satellite. If we increase the mass of the satellite, you can see the force getting bigger, gravitational force getting bigger, but it does not affect the orbit. The mass of the satellite is not affecting the orbital path. So it's not a factor that we need to consider when we're putting the satellite into orbit. It's just that velocity that we need to be a particular distance from the Earth. And there it is in summary. We've got planets, this time it's a planet, not a satellite, but we've got a planet that's wanting to go in a straight line, but we've got gravitational force on the planet. Gravity always provides this force. This diagram, we've got a planet orbiting the sun. The velocity is at 90 degrees to the gravitational force. So that stops the planet from getting any closer to the sun and 
here we've got a circular orbit. Data question for you then. Two minutes. I want you to use the data here on planets, their distances from the sun and their orbital velocity. Number one, how does the orbital radius affect the orbital velocity? Number two, why do you think that that must be the case? I'm going to give you two minutes. minute gone. Question one, if you've done it qualitatively, make sure that you've used some number. And if you can, if you can do it quantitatively, actually try and use some numbers to show a mathematical relationship between the mean distance and the orbital velocity. Any exam question where you've got a table like that, please make sure that you're using values, even if you're just quoting them, saying, for example, planet whatever has got a whatever. Make sure you use the numbers. First one then. So as the radius increases, in other words, the distance from the sun increases. I'm using the word radius because we're talking about circular, roughly circular anyway, orbits. So as the radius increases, the orbital velocity decreases. So as that distance goes up in the middle column, the velocity is going down. Doubling the radius, less than halves the velocity. So let's have a look at some numbers. I've picked Saturn and Uranus. The reason I picked them, there are other numbers that you could use, is that the distance of Uranus from the Sun is roughly twice the size of Saturn. To the sun. So if we go from 1433.5 to 2872.5, it's an increase of two. Let's have a look then what that does to the orbital velocity. So it's going from 9.7 to 6.8. So it's going down, but it's actually going down by a factor of 1.4. So doubling that distance less than halves the orb orbital velocity. Question two then. For a planet like Mercury, the force of gravity on it from the Sun is greater. That means that Mercury needs to go an awful lot faster in order to prevent it from falling towards the Sun. So the planets that are much further away have got a slower velocity. So if you're going to be orbiting very close to your object, you need to have a very high orbital velocity. Let's start off modelling the moon then, orbiting the Earth. A couple of things to look at. I'll just mark you on the orbital path. First thing to look at is that the same face of the moon is always 
pointed towards us. So effectively, as it does one full rotation of the Earth, it spins on its own axis once. So we always see the same face facing towards us. Let's look at the amount of time, the orbital period it takes to orbit the Earth. I'll just reset it to make it a little bit easier. So go, let's count the Earth days here. So about 28 days, 27, 28 days for one full orbit. As well as the same face facing towards us, I'd like you to have a look now at the wobble. I'll zoom in a touch. I'll mark on the gravitational forces. If you look at the Earth carefully, you'll see that the Earth is actually wobbling slightly each rotation. And that's because the moon is relatively large, certainly compared to a satellite. And it's not just a case of the moon orbiting around the Earth. They're actually orbiting around the center of mass. If you imagine a, a dumbbell in space spinning, they'd rotate about the middle. It's just causing the Earth to wobble. That is a way that we can detect orbiting bodies around distant stars, distant planets, is looking at that small amount of wobble. If I increase the moon mass and make it a different moon, so one and a half times and then twice as big, you'll see the orbital period doesn't change but we are getting a bigger wobble because we've got a, a greater a greater mass of the moon. Let's have a quick look at the Earth in orbit around the sun then. Set it off going. Mark on the path. The Earth's orbit around the sun then, 365 and a quarter days for a full orbit. It's very close to being circular, not exactly circular. The Earth is very slightly closer to the sun in the northern winter. So around at the end of December, it's slightly closer, but not by much. So again, let's recap. We've got gravity affecting both but because the sun is so much bigger you don't notice its movement we've got the earth rotating round and it doesn't fall directly into the center of the sun because of its velocity sideways what i'd like to do is just look at the effect of changing the planet's mass so if the earth was twice the size we get no effect on the orbital velocity or the orbital distance that we have it at. So it's not a factor as we've discussed with satellites before. Let's put it back to its actual size. The sun though, as we looked at in the last lesson on life cycle of a star, will change in its lifetime and it will lose some mass as it gets towards the end of its life. So let's have a look at the effect of it losing some mass. I'm just going to zoom out a bit. So it loses a bit of mass. And if you have a look at that orbit, you'll see that because we've now got a decreased force, we've got that orbit is adjusting itself where it's because of the smaller force, it's moving further away. Zoom out even more. If the sun loses even more, it will move further out. In the, the end life stages of the sun, the planets will start to move slightly further away in their orbits. The orbits will be slightly bigger. And remember, when the sun gets towards the end of its lifetime, it will swell into a red giant and it should probably just about reach the, the orbit of the Earth and swallow it up. Lastly, let's look at elliptical orbits. I've set this up so we've got an elliptical orbit. I've made the mass of the orbiting body half that of the Earth. That's as 
as low as I can do it. And we'll mark on the orbital path so that you can see the shape. So we've got an ellipse. But the same thing is true. That's a stable orbit. But in order for that orbit to stay stable, the velocity has got to increase when the gravitational force increases. So if I put the gravitational force on, you'll notice it force goes up considerably as it gets much closer to the sun, which means the velocity has to be increasing as it goes around as well. So it moves much faster through that little bit of the orbit where it's close to the sun. And a lot of comets behave like that. They can be missing way, way out in the far reaches of the solar system for thousands of years, but they're on elliptical orbit and they can come back in hurtling towards us, gaining velocity as they go. The tails developing as they heat up, as they get closer, so that we see them for a fleeting period of time as they pass near us, as they come into the solar system, and then, and then they're off back out again. Most famous comet being Halley's Comet, um, 78, 80 years, can't quite remember, but that's the orbital period. A lot of comets have got a much, much greater orbital period than that. We can use this effect with space travel. If you've got a, a space ship that you want to change direction by flying close to a star or close to a moon or close to a planet, you can use that increase in gravitational force to either increase the speed to gain some velocity to, to send you off somewhere else or just to change the direction. We can use that without using any fuel from the spaceship. I'm going to give you two minutes then. Question artificial satellites. Let's see if you've got any prior knowledge. There are a few things that I've mentioned already. Two minutes, question one, two and three. Halfway through your time. first picture that you can see on the right is the first satellite that was put into space by the Russians in 1957, Sputnik, and it sent out a signal. It was the first time that we put an object, an artificial satellite, up in orbit. That was used really as an exper experiment to see what you can do with a satellite in orbit. The bottom picture you've got there is a satellite called Astra, and that's the one that Sky uses to bounce pictures off for your satellite TV. So a signal is sent up, it bounces off that satellite and then bounces back down towards Earth 
goes through the atmosphere because we use microwaves that will go through the atmosphere and then that's picked up by the satellite dish that you have on the side of your house and you'll notice that satellite dishes in the UK all point south and that's because they're pointing at where that satellite is in the sky. So a sky satellite Astra there is an example of being used for communications, telecommunications but also we have satellites that are used for scientific research, weather, GPS. I'll give you a list so that you can make some notes in a minute. Sorts of orbits they have, you can put them in all sorts. You could put them in circular orbits, you could put them into elliptical orbits, and you can put them into orbits at different distances from the Earth so that they will move at different velocities and be at different heights above the surface of the Earth. Problems you can have with artificial satellites, they're quite easy to get knocked off course and they can get damaged by cosmic rays coming from space and particularly from the sun can be enough to knock them off a little bit and damage them. But also if you've got satellites that are in low orbit, you can have problems with them dragging on the very thin atmosphere that you've got there. But we'll come to more of that in just a second. So a list, probably a good idea to make a note or come back to it at the end so that you've got a record. So we use them for communications, telecommunications, satellite TV and satellite phone calls. Observations of the earth, like weather forecasting, tracking storms, looking at pollution. We take continual temperatures of the Earth's surface so we can monitor global warming, spying, satellite photography, Google images, for example. Using for navigation, GPS, so your GPS system that you might have on your car or on your phone will look at the time it takes for a signal to reach three different satellites and then by that it can work out exactly where you are on the Earth's surface from them. We use them for astronomy, Hubble Space Telescope, great to be using them for telescopes up there because you've got no atmosphere to be looking through so you get a much clearer image. Let's look then at artificial satellites and their orbits. That picture there, we've got two different orbits. We've got a geostationary orbit and a polar orbit. So by putting them in different types of orbits, we can use them for different purposes. Geostationary orbit. Geo means Earth, stationary means still. Now we know it can't be still because if you just plonk a satellite in space it'll come hurtling down and, and collide with the earth because of gravity we need to be giving it a velocity to keep it going round we put it in such a place as it takes exactly 24 hours for one complete rotation because the earth then is rotating underneath it at 24 hours as well it appears to stay over the same point now that's perfect if you want a satellite that you always want to communicate with I mentioned Astra, the sky satellite. That's an example of a geostationary orbit. Your satellite dish doesn't move about on the side of your house. It's pointing at a particular place and that's because it's pointing at the place where that satellite is. They're great for TV and for GPS. Polar orbit, different purpose, generally a lot lower and going around much quicker than the 24 hours. If you have a satellite in a polar orbit like that one, as it's whipping round once every 90 minutes, the Earth's rotating underneath and then over quite a short period of time, that satellite will have passed over every point in the Earth, which means if you want to take photographs, continual photographs of something that's going on on the Earth's surface, you can, from that satellite, see every point. That's a reliable launch vehicle that we use. So it's a rocket that will take a payload and we can take quite heavy payloads into space. So we can put satellites in into space using it. We used to use the space shuttle, which is was a reusable version. So we can take up nearly five tons of stuff. I want you to think about the forces and velocities involved to get that rocket into space and then to put a satellite into a stable orbit. I'll give you two minutes, write down what, what you can, try and describe it.
coming up to just way halfway through your time think about your takeoff and you get in into the orbit itself and then what must you do to get a satellite into a stable orbit The first part then is getting the rocket off the ground. So to get any object off the ground, you need a force upwards that is greater than the gravitational force downwards. And the way a rocket does that is to put a force on the burning fuel out of the back. And then because for every force there's an equal and opposite force, that's Newton's third law, the rocket puts a force on the fuel and the fuel puts a force on the rocket so the rocket accelerates upwards. F equals ma. So we're accelerating upwards, then the rocket needs to get into orbit going at the velocity that you need for that satellite to be in a stable orbit. So if you want to put, say, the International Space Station, if you want to get to the International Space Station, you'll need to go in an orbit that's fast enough for you to rotate once every 90 minutes. So you get to that point. And then when you, you're at that point orbiting the Earth with the rocket, you can then just release your satellite, open the doors, let the satellite go out. You've got no air resistance, assuming you're a high enough orbit. So then that satellite will be going at the velocity that you've released it at. It'll be going at the same velocity of the rocket and it will then orbit in a circle around and you've got yourself, at least initially, a stable orbit. So you've got to match the speed of the satellite to the radius that you want. If your orbit's too small and you're going close to the Earth, speed's not fast enough, otherwise it's going to crash into the Earth. What can happen is that an orbiting satellite can get hit by bits of debris that might be in space or in orbit, or even... If it's not in a very high orbit, there's a tiny, tiny bit of atmosphere and it can be enough to slow it down through drag. And as it slows down, it won't be going fast enough so it'll lose altitude and eventually crash into the Earth. This has happened a few times. In the 1970s, there was a, a satellite in space that the American used for scientific research called Skylab. And... When they first put it up, they realised that it was losing a little bit of height and they didn't have any rocket boosters on there to increase its velocity. So it ended up falling from orbit in 1979 and, and burning up on re-entry. I want to now look at acceleration and circular motion. It's often a question that's tagged on to the end of another one. It takes a little bit of explaining. So we've got an object that's going in a circle. Now, if you're going to make an object travel in a circle, it could be a, a stone on a string or it could be a satellite going around the Earth. To make it go in a circle, you've got to have a force on it. If you don't have a force on it, it'll go in a straight line. That's Newton's first law. Everybody continues in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by some external force. So we've got to have a force on it if it's not going on a straight line. And the force is going to be pulling it towards the centre of the circle. If we're talking about satellites or planets or moons, then we're talking about gravity. If we've got a ball on a string, then that force is tension. But that force is always towards the centre of the circle. 
if we've got an overall force on something then, then it must be accelerating. That's Newton's second law. If we've got a force, it accelerates. So even if an object is going round in a circle with a steady speed, it's still accelerating. Velocity is a vector, so it's not good enough just be going at a steady speed if the direction's changing. If the direction is changing with a vector, then you've got acceleration. So the acceleration on an object going in a circle will be in the same direction as the forces, so towards the centre of the circle. So an orbiting object is accelerating constantly towards the object that it's orbiting around. You'll need that bit then to answer this three mark question. You need to just go back in the video, go back and then explain why the velocity of a satellite changes as it orbits the Earth. halfway through your time you might have noticed that the size of the arrows it's a vector arrow there v1 v2 representing the velocities at two different points the size of those arrows are the same the mark scheme on then. So one mark by using the word acceleration. So if you said the satellite is accelerating, it's fine. The acceleration causes a change in direction. So the key is the size of the velocity arrow is the same. But because the direction is constantly changing it means that it must be accelerating because the velocity is not the same the velocity changes because it's a vector so finally I'll leave you with a summary then couple of different orbits we've got for satellites diagram showing the force and the velocity at 90 degrees to each other little diagram in the bottom of how you get an orbit by just getting the right velocity so that it's curving towards the earth at the same as the curvature of the earth and then lastly if the orbit's going to remain stable you've got to make sure that the radius changes if the speed changes. So in other words, if you want to have your satellite going slower, you've got to move it away from the surface of the Earth. Otherwise, it's going to end up spiralling down and colliding with the Earth. So that's the end of that lesson. Thanks for working on that. There's a couple of lessons left of space. I'll see you next time.